Welcome back. I'm in the chair again, so that means you're here with me. Oh, you're lucky. So um, last time we just kind of briefly looked at how to look at pun and squares. Um, so you probably are used to just this regular old complete dominance. That means as long as you have a capital letter, like you got a capital T, well, it's going to show the dominant. If I got a lowercase t, I'm going to show the recessive. And using the language that we used last time, that means as long as you have one dominant allele, you will show the dominant trait. You're probably used to that being the norm and that being probably everything that you've learned. Guess what? Um, that is actually not most things. Mendel got really lucky that the P plant traits that he looked at were pretty much all complete dominance. Very convenient, right? Lucky, lucky, lucky. Um, but many traits are not like that. And so today I want to take a little bit of time and I want to go over some of them with you. So there are many ways our genes interact to express our traits. And, um, one of them is complete dominance. That's the one that you've probably been working with your whole life. Um, another one is called incomplete or partial dominance. The, we have co-dominance, pleiotropy, polygenic traits, and there are environmental interactions. And so what I mean by that last one is there are ways that our environment influences how our body is going to express our traits. Um, we'll get to that. When we get to it, it won't be right this minute. So, um, so my head's in the way. Surprise. Okay, so incomplete dominance. I don't think I can move my head. No, it's stuck there. Sorry. Um, incomplete dominance or partial dominance, which is covered by my head, which you could always go back and you could just see right here. Um, so what is that? Um, so if the offspring is heterozygous, and recall that heterozygous means having one dominant allele, letter, and one recessive allele, letter, so one capital, one lowercase. Um, the trait will partly show up, so you're used to it being if something is heterozygous, having one dominant, one recessive, it shows the dominant. That's called complete dominance. This is not that. Here's an example. So we have these carnations. Thank you. Um, and we have a parent, one red parent and one white parent. Okay, so I, I know you're thinking flowers can be parents. Yes. So the pollen, that's that's plant sperm, um, will go over to the female plant, which has the pistil. It'll land on there. The pollen will grow a tube down to the um, to the ovary and connect to this little ovule, which is an egg. And that's fertilization, kind of like how egg and sperm come together to make a, a human or a mammalian baby. So yes, and their offspring are seeds that grow and change into the plant. So we have mommy flower and daddy flower. One is red, the other is white. You can see the dominant and recessive alleles here represented by capital and lowercase letters. Well, normally you would think, okay, well, these two are going to have flower babies and they're all going to be red because we have at least one capital letter. Nope. We're learning something new. Actually, all their flower babies will be pink, okay, because this trait for flower color is incomplete dominance. Here's how we can kind of use our imagination to think about this. One gene, the capital R allele, says, you know what? We're going to make red. This code that I have, this capital R code, says make red color. The little r code is, you can think of it as being maybe broken, um, it says make nothing, don't do not do anything at all, make no color. And so when they're put together, it makes some color. It has one gene that says we're going to make red, and another allele that says I'm, just, I'm not going to make anything. And so it makes some red, and that appears as pink. So this is one example. Usually if you take a test, this is the example they give you is with pink and white, or red and pink and white flowers. Um, but there are other examples. Oops, come on, girl. Okay, and then if we crossed pink flowers together, this is what we would see. We would see 25% red, 50% pink, and 25% white. So we would see the grandparents, the original parents, back. Okay, so you can take a minute pause and just kind of look at how this um, Punnett square has been set up and done and why it is the way it is. Okay, again, my lovely head and body, my, my bust, I guess, if it was our class, is over here. Um, covering the word codominance. So what is codominance? This is cool. Okay, this happens um, 
when this happens, the two alleles are both dominant, okay? You know dominant people in your life. I'm not one of them. Um, but one person is going to say, it's black. The other person is going to say, it's white. And neither one's going to back down. Well, that's kind of the case. Let's look at these chickens, um, for example. One parent's like, we're going to have black feathers for our baby. And the other says, no, we're going to have white feathers. And both of them are not going to back down. Neither allele is going to back down, meaning both alleles, if they're there, will be present. And that's how you get a checkered chicken. It's got black and white feathers. I know it looks gray. Look, Do yourself a favor. Look up a picture of a checkered chicken. They're cute. Um, so here's a tiny one. Um, both the black and white will show up. That's how you get this or spotted animals. A lot of times they call these roan cows. They'll call them pink cows because the parent will be a red cow, <laughs> excuse me, and a white cow. And that'll produce a pink cow. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't look pink to me. It's spotted, spotted brown and white. You can see that in flowers or in horses. So in codominance, both traits show up. Um, our blood types are like that, okay? Um, I'm not sure if we'll get into this today, because remember, free software, I only have 10 minutes, and that's going to take a whole bit of time, so that might be a whole other video. Um, pleiotropy is when you have one gene that can affect many traits. For example, dwarfism, certain types of dwarfism can affect many traits in the body. There's one gene, and it's going to affect the size of their bones and their height. Same thing with certain types of gigantism. Um, here's an example of um, dwarfism in a Punnett square. So if you want to pause and just take, take a look at that. Um, dwarfism is dominant. Um, and the, the double dominant, the two dominant alleles, unfortunately, as far as I know, is a fatal allele. So any child born of a parent or two parents that have dwarfism, um, if there's the double dominant, that child doesn't usually survive for very long, unfortunately. Um, but that also shows how you can have um, even two dwarf parents have what you'd consider a normal-sized child, someone who does not have dwarfism. Um, so take a look at that. It's, like, it's an interesting thing to research and learn about. Okay. Oh, polygenic inheritance. This is where you have one trait influenced by many genes. So what are examples? Your skin color, your eye color, your hair color, your height. Um, so this last one on there I saw, I kept on there, but intelligence, there's a lot of things that in, affect what you might consider intelligence. So just take that with a grain of salt. Your behavior. Um, so these are people lined up by height. It's kind of faded out here, but it says height is a polygenic trait. Um, this shape that you see here is called a bell curve, where there aren't that many short people. There aren't that many super tall people. Most people are somewhere in the middle. Why? Because there's many genes that influence that, so you're more likely to get something that's in the middle. Um, you see this kind of curve for lots of things, for test scores and for just, just a lot of other things. Um, so next we come to blood types. We're not going to talk about that because that's going to take me some time. I'm going to do a whole thing just on blood, probably. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is environmental interactions. Um, so your body is influenced by your genes and the environment. So you can imagine, um, just, just try to think of um, if you had an identical twin, or if I did, and they smoke and I don't, how that would affect my body, um, or the types of cancer we might get, or if my twin exercised. And I didn't. That's more like real life. Um, how I might put on more weight and they might be more lean and they might be more muscular. They might have a lower heart rate, even though we would be identical twins. So the environment influences your traits as well. Um, for example, you can look at me. I'm kind of light skinned. But if I spent more time in the sun, my, my skin would be more tan. If I lived in an area where there was more sun, I'd probably have a tan more often part of part of the year than not. My skin would never be very, very, very dark because even though I have genes that say make melanin, I don't have as much as someone with naturally darker skin. Um, you've probably seen these flowers if you live near where I do. Um, this is the color of the ones that exist near us. Our soil produces blue flowers. I'm pretty sure that means our soil around here is basic. If the soil is slightly more acidic, the flower color will be pink. So depending on the soil it's planted in, this flower called a hydrangea will express different colors. It could be literally the exact same.